If you're one of those people that are still hovering over the buy button for a Mac Mini in your cart at apple.com, then this video is for you. Maybe you've promised yourself one for Christmas, or you're going to give it as a gift over Thanksgiving. Well, in this video, I'm going to be comparing Apple Silicon over five iterations. I have got an M3 iMac with eight gigs of RAM. I've got an M3 MacBook Air with 16 gigs of RAM. I've got a Mac Mini with 24 gigs of RAM, a Mac Mini Pro with 48 gigs of RAM, and an M1 MacBook Pro with 32 gigs of RAM. And in this video, I am going to be breaking my rules. I've always said that I wouldn't do benchmark tests, but you know, sometimes you've just got to go with the numbers. Sometimes numbers don't lie. And I think these Macs are so closely spec, particularly the M4 Mac Mini, the M4 Pro Mac Mini, and the MacBook Pro that I've got with the M1 Max chip, that numbers really are the only way to really separate out to see what's going on. So that's why for the first time ever on this channel, I am going to be running some benchmark tests. This video will almost be in two halves. First of all, it will be the tests and they're really exhaustive tests. I was stressing the CPU and the GPU and I thought you might like to know at no time did any of the five Macs here ever spin up a fan. They've been quiet all day long, no matter how hard I pushed them. And once we've gone through all the tests with the facts, numbers and figures, then we're going to go over to, well, you're going to see me export this video, the video you're watching now, I'm going to export it off of different Macs. And we're going to see how they handle it, particularly, of course, the M4 Pro Mac Mini and the M1 Max MacBook Pro, and hopefully also the M4 Mac Mini as well. The file is going to be pretty chunky. There's going to be my Canon footage, there's going to be the ProRes log footage from the 16 Pro Max, with a uh, color correction on it, of course. There's gonna be B-roll, there'll be transitions, and there'll be 3D motion VFX plugins as well. So it's gonna be a chunky file, and we'll see how all of these Macs handle running it and exporting it. So this video really is kind of the best of both worlds, if you like. You've got empirical figures, numbers, black and white facts, and also real world usage. The most I ever put my Macs through is when I'm editing and exporting videos. So I'm going to show you what it's like on these Macs in a real world test as well. I said best of both worlds. And it might be because of the Mac Mini and all the fuss that's around the Mac Mini that you land on one of my videos for the first time. My name is David and I make videos about Apple gear, all Apple gear, every single week here on the channel. Why? Simply because I love what I do, I love what I use, and I love talking to you about it. Before we get going into the facts and figures, there was just two mm, fairly cosmetic, fairly minor things that I wanted to mention to you. The first of those is the packaging, funny enough, and the design. Not the design itself, the design is gorgeous of the Mac Minis. They really are beautiful machines. No, what I mean by the design is when you look at the packaging, for instance, there's no mention this is the Mac Mini Pro. When it was delivered this week, I was so worried that orders have been messed up or orders have been duplicated. I was looking everywhere on the box and it's tiny little print, the spec, of what you've ordered. You would have thought surely it'd been a good idea just to differentiate Mac Mini Pro on the box. And it's the same on the actual Mac Mini itself. I thought when I flip it over, like it does on the MacBook Pro, it might say something like Mac Mini Pro. It makes sense, right? But there's nothing on the base plate at all. There's nothing to separate these two machines out. It's a tiny point, I know, but something I would have thought, certainly for the extra money that you're spending, would have been a good idea. And Thunderbolt 5. Now, Thunderbolt 5 is something that first came to most of us just a few weeks ago at the Apple event. And of course, Apple put up this great big figure of 120 gigabits. And we thought that was kind of the data speed. There was a little star by the side of it. And as ever, the devil is in the detail. I've kind of touched on it in other videos. Thunderbolt 5 will double the standard data transfer speed to 80 gigabits per second in both directions by using some kind of bandwidth boost mode, which reach up to 120 gigabits for video intensive tasks. But don't forget, you're also gonna need the correct cables. They don't come cheap, as you know, uh, for instance, from Apple, you can buy one at the moment for about 70 pounds. Now, as good as the IO is, on these Mac minis. We all know we've got two ports on the front, three ports on the back, plus your ethernet port, plus your HDMI port. But it's amazing how quickly you begin to run out of ports. When I was making this video, I've got two audio interfaces and a display on the back. I was using an external SSD for a few bits of footage and files that I needed to bring over. And also, of course, I needed an SD card reader. And that is one of the flaws they made. An SD card reader certainly on the Mac Mini Pro would have been a real godsend. That would have just made this just that little bit better. It's not a big thing, but it would just made it that little bit better. And also maybe even a USB-A port. Now I don't like going back in time, but I've had to use adapters on the back of the Mac Mini for one of the audio interfaces I've got. And it would just be nice if I didn't have to bother searching out an adapter and we could have just had maybe one USB-A port on there as well. But in one of the other videos I mentioned, when I was talking about Thunderbolt 5, I said, now Apple have sort of stolen the chase on it. Other third party manufacturers were sure to catch up and that is happening. OWC seem to be the real ones that are catching up very, very quickly. They've got this Thunderbolt 5 
Envoy Ultra SSD, and it looks like it should be a really good piece of kit. You can buy two terabytes for $399 with Apple, that would have cost $600, or you can buy a four terabyte version of it for $599 from OWC, and with Apple, that would have cost $1,200. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of money. And they're quoting on OWC's website, they're quoting transfer speeds of 6,000 megabits per second. So they should be quick. And not only have OWC got that SSD, they've also got a Thunderbolt 5 hub, which will give you four extra Thunderbolt 5 ports as well. I've left links for both of those in the description. I'm not making a penny from them. I just thought as I'd found them, I'd leave the links for you in the description. So now I think we need to begin talking about these tests and exactly what I've done today. Just to set the ground rules, first of all, there were no other apps open on any of the Macs when I was running these tests. And also I restarted all of the Macs as well. We're going to run four exhaustive tests over those five Macs, the M3 iMac, the M3 MacBook Air, the two Mac Minis, and also my M1 Macs MacBook Pro. There's going to be a Geekbench CPU test, an SSD read and write test, a Cinebench test, and a Geekbench GPU test as well. By the end of it, we should have some fairly comprehensive figures and begin to see where the dust is settling. So first, we're gonna get into that Geekbench CPU test and see how they perform. This test includes compression, rendering web pages and PDFs, running developer scripts, and doing machine learning tasks like object detection and background blur. The single core helps give a sense of how fast the Mac performs under certain situations when only a single processing core is handling everything. Many applications, as you know, have their performance limited by a single main thread. So single core CPU performance will determine just how fast they run. Other applications though, they're designed to be multi-threaded so that lots of processes can run at the same time. The multi-core results show you how well these Macs can perform when pushed to their absolute limit as they'll use multiple processing cores at once to handle the strain. Think of it as a, a Max pushing a Mac to the absolute limit to see how much we can stress it. And sure enough, there are some interesting results here as well. The M3 iMac with eight gigs of memory got a score of 2,983 and 11,553 for single and multi-core respectively. The M3 MacBook Air with 16 gigs of memory got a score of 3,158 and 11,942. The M4 Mac Mini with 24 gigs of memory, that's the non-pro chip, got a score of 3,833 and 14,296. I just thought I'd throw in the M4 iPad Pro, which got a really impressive score of 3,752 and 14,157. And now for the top two spots, the M1 MacBook Pro with 32 gigs of memory got 2,390 and 12,802. And the scores on the M4 Pro Mac Mini with 48 gigs of memory got a score of 3,929 and 22,763. Pretty impressive figures. You can see that this M4 Pro chip is gonna be um, as good as everyone's been saying. So that's the first of the tests out of the way. Next, I'm gonna do an SSD test. This test placed a virtual four gig folder on the desktop and measured how fast it could be duplicated to the Max SSD. It will also give you an idea of how fast things will be written to the drive and how fast apps and files will open and load. I use the five gig stress test option via the desktop on this test. And again, running through the numbers, the M3 iMac, got a score of 1,350 megabits per second and 1,500 megabits per second. The M3 MacBook Air, an impressive leap forward actually, with the extra memory there, got uh, 2,800 megabits per second read and write, virtually the same for read and write. The M4 Mac Mini, 3,500 megabits per second and 2,950 megabits per second. I ran these tests two or three times just to begin to get an average figure so that I was giving you as good an indication as possible. The M4 Pro Mac Mini got a score of 6,000 megabits per second and 5,000 megabits per second. And the M1 Max MacBook Pro, that scored 7,000 megabits per second and 5,500 megabits per second. So it's clearly those two that are running head and head. And as we progress through these tests, I'll begin, I think you'll begin to see that they get very, very interesting numbers. Having checked the SSD and the CPU, we're now going to look at the GPU, the all important GPU. I'm going to run two tests here, a Geekbench test and also the Cinebench test as well. These tests are going to look at the graphical performance of the Macs. Firstly, the Cinebench test, which was a 10 minute multi core test that stressed the 3D graphics rendering performance by looking at an image with light, reflections, and shadows. The scores are measured in FPS in frames per second. In last place, as you'd imagine, was the M3 iMac with a score of 7,680. The M3 MacBook Air scored 9,438. Now here's a surprise, the M1 Max MacBook Pro only managed third spot here with a score of 12,143. That means in my up position was the M4 Mac Mini, which got a score of 13,518 
and the M4 Pro Mac Mini got an amazing score of 19,000. 426 FPS. Now we're going to go on to that Geekbench test. It's slightly different than the other test. This will see how the Macs handle computational tasks like detection of images, applying a Gaussian blur to a 24 megapixel photo, or detecting faces in photos. The M3 iMac got a score of 41,599. The M3 MacBook Air, 46,356. The M4 Mac Mini, 53,963. The M1 Max MacBook Pro, 103,137, and winning by a long way, the M4 Pro Mac Mini with a score of 103,790. So it's clear that this M4 silicon that we've been looking at is pretty special. The M1 Max MacBook Pro and the M4 Pro only, M4 Pro Apple silicon chip are head and head. And that's what I was wondering when I went out and bought this machine, how close with that three year gap would these honestly be? Obviously, there's going to be a test coming when I begin to do a real world test of exporting and seeing what the playback's like of all of these chunky files I'm going to be using. But the actual black and white figures have made for some really interesting reading. I reckon you'll agree. This M4 Apple Silicon really does look special. We knew it was going to be something good. All the figures suggested it was going to be something good. And now we've got our hands on it. It really is amazing to use. When I started using the M4 Mac Mini last week, it was quick. Now I'm beginning to get my hands on the M4 Pro Mac Mini, it's impressive. I don't know how many people would actually need it, but hey, that's what I'm here to try and help you make decisions and help you save money. So the next thing I'm gonna do is take a break from the facts and figures and come back with some editing, show you real world tests. I said, it's gonna be using Final Cut Pro 11 on different Macs, and it's all gonna be using Canon footage, ProRes log footage, transitions, and motion VFX plugins. Be interested to see how these handle it and what those real world test figures suggest and if they come out anywhere close to these figures we've just seen in these tests. But before I get into that, there is one thing that you know you want to do. You really know you want to do something. It's at the back of your brain. You're thinking, what is it? Subscribe. It's as simple as that. As you can see, I've been out spending good money. I want to bring you really up-to-date, relevant information, but it doesn't come cheap and I need your help. And if you can just subscribe to the channel, I'd still love to get to 15,000 subs by the end of the year. Do you reckon we can do it? Am I making the content you enjoy? If you do, that sub makes a massive difference. Don't forget, turn on notifications as well so that you know the moment I upload a new video. Right, I'm going to take a break and get to editing, and I'll be back with you with some interesting information about that, I dare say. And as promised, after a couple of days, I'm back with my final thoughts. It's been a long couple of days using both of these Mac Minis, and we'll look at the export times of the video that you've been watching in just a moment. I've used benchmarks for the very first time as you know. Now, it could be that I've used them incorrectly. There are other tests you'd like me to run. If that's the case, let me know in the comments. I use benchmarks because I felt it was a really good way to get some baseline figures to show you, which I think we've done. It's the most comprehensive video that I've ever made, which is why it's taken me so long to edit it and get it to you. But I think the wait has hopefully been, has hopefully been worth it. Any faults I had with the Mac Minis while I was working on them? Just two, two minor ones. I got a disc almost full warning on the Mac Mini Pro. That's got terabyte storage on. If you've worked in Final Cut, you'll know that the cache file builds up really, really quickly. Once I deleted that, that was fine. So it wasn't the Mac that was at fault. On the other M4 Mac Mini, I did get one beach ball when I was loading a 3D plugin for Motion VFX onto the timeline. Uh, Final Cut 11 crashed, had to restart it just once. Those are the only issues that I've had. The file that I was working on was chock full of all sorts. It had ProRes log footage from the iPhone 16, which needed obviously color grading and adjusting. We had the Canon footage in there. We had WAV 32-bit audio in there, loads of plugins for Motion VFX, 3D plugins for Motion VFX, new plugins from Final Cut Pro 11, all sorts is going on in there. It was a really proper big file to test, the kind of file that I'd be using week in, week out. And I think, it was a reasonably good test to throw at it. It ended up being a five and a little bit gig file. It's a .mp4 file we're gonna be exporting it to. But on the whole, I've got nothing but great things to say about both of these Mac Minis. The entire video you're watching now was recorded and edited entirely on the M4 Mac Mini Pro, everything. The only time that project moved around was when I was exporting it off the other two Macs just to get some times for you. But the whole project was worked on on the Mac Mini Pro and at no point did I ever miss my M1 Max MacBook Pro, it's almost seamless. Now let's talk about the export times. That's what we're really here for. Exactly the same project loaded onto three different Macs. The MacBook Pro, my M1 Max MacBook Pro, which costs three and a half thousand pounds, is three years old, exported in four minutes, 56 seconds. 
The Mac Mini Pro, that exported it in five minutes and three seconds, so just seven seconds longer. Virtually nothing, a blink of an eye, a couple of blinks of an eye. It was, it was and seamless, so quick. And even the Mac Mini, the standard M4 Mac Mini, only took five minutes, 42 seconds. So just under a minute longer for a machine that only cost a thousand pounds. Just let those figures sit with you for a moment. Between the MacBook Pro and the base M4 Mac Mini, not the, admits uh, in the mid-tier base, but it's not the Pro chip, was only just under a minute in export time difference. That is amazing. There has never been a fan, not while I was doing all of the benchmark tests, not while I was working in Final Cut over the last couple of days, nothing. They have been quiet. The thermals are fantastic. Working in a multi uh, display environment has been fine as well. I haven't been able to stress these mach machines enough and make them break apart from that one beach ball that I had on the M4 Mac Mini. Now, as much as there's no such thing as a bargain, it's all well and good to say these are only a thousand pounds or two thousand pounds in the case of my M4 Pro Mac Mini. Of course, you need to have good peripherals. When you buy a MacBook Pro, you're getting a fantastic display as well. So if I took my M4 Pro Mac Mini, 2,200 pounds, added on my studio display, which I think is still 1,500 pounds, you're 3,700 pounds. Apple and no fools. It's around about the same price. But most of us, of course, have actually got peripherals. In my instance, I've got a studio display, I've got the keyboard, I've got the mouse. So it is literally just buying the Mac Mini. Then, then it is actually a bargain. I, I know that next year we're getting the Mac Studio with the Ultra chip in it. I don't know who needs it. I don't work any harder than this. And these two Mac Minis really haven't missed a beat in two or three days solid of using them. They have been an absolute joy to use. So who would need an Ultra chip? Who would need a Mac Pro come to that? These things are so good. It's quite obvious now that we're going to need to spend less money to be more productive. And don't forget, these things are portable as well. You could almost use it as an external backup drive. <laughs> you really could. You could put a whole project in there and just carry one away with you if you wanted to do that. It's an expensive way of working, but you know what I'm meaning. They are amazing machines. And following on from a video that I made a couple of weeks ago, it's just lovely to hear that Apple have got it right and everybody is enjoying what Apple has created for us with these Mac Minis. Universally, they're being praised, and quite rightly so. They're possibly the best Mac ever because they're just so compliant, they're so performant, and they're so portable. They are lighter to move around than a MacBook Pro. Probably lighter, even, than a MacBook Air, and certainly lighter than my M4 iPad Pro. They're brilliant machines. I've got nothing but good to say about them. If you want to see me do some more tests, if you're a musician and you've got a big audition file, I don't work in Logic, but if you work in Audition and you've got a file you can send me that's native with no plugins, send it to me. I'll run it in Audition. I'll bounce out a file from it and we'll see how we get on with that. Same if you're a designer and working in Photoshop. My Photoshop files are mid-range. If you've got a multi-layered Photoshop file, again, native to Adobe, you want to send me and see me export, send that through and I'll happily run those tests. And again, if there's anything I missed in those bench tests, let me know. But the, the tests that we've run have shown just how good, particularly the M4 Pro Mac Mini is, but both of these Mac Minis, they haven't broken a sweat a week and they haven't let me down. They are amazing machines. Do you need to go for a Pro? Probably not. There was a minute difference in that export time and that was on a really heavy, heavy video session. It's up to you to choose, but I think you can probably save yourself some money and buy a really well specced mid-range M4 Mac Mini. Everything you heard about these machines turns out to be true. If you're wondering why I spent so much money on this M4 Pro Mac Mini, there's a video on screen now explaining why I put those specs together and why I spent so much.